Well, let's let's take one more idea seriously. Uh, so, for the sake of time, uh, let's 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 move on uh, to uh, the free will stuff. Uh, he he does the uh, the same thing here that he does in the moral case, which is that he takes you know the part of the philosophical debate about free will and determinism that's the most controversial is how how should we understand what would count as free will, mm-hmm. and he has a certain intuition about that and he just runs with it. And he's very dismissive of anybody who has any sort of argument that he's wrong about it in much the same way that he has a certain kind of intuition about, you know, morality being, you know, maximizing well-being, whatever exactly that means. Uh, And he's very dismissive of anybody who has any non-consequentialist view of morality. But uh, I think uh, in particular in what what we're about to see, uh, he he has uh, a, uh, he has an argument that actually might change Ryan's mind uh, so, uh, so Ryan is starting out disagreeing with Sam Harris about free will. Uh, Ryan has a position called compatibilism. Uh, but I think that when you hear this business about movies, uh, oh. then then you're gonna you're gonna change your mind. Let's run with the turn. Just close your eyes. And take a few deep breaths. And now think of a movie. The one you've seen, or just one you know the name of, right? It doesn't have to be good, it can be bad, whatever comes to mind, doesn't matter. And pay attention to what this experience is like. A few films have probably come to mind. Just pick one. And pay attention to what the experience of choosing is like. Now, the first thing to notice is that this is as free a choice as you are ever going to make in your life, right? You are completely free. You have all the films in the world to choose from and you can pick anyone you want. And you can pause this audio and take as long as you want. Now let's do that again. I want you to become sensitive to this process. So forget the first film and choose another. And again, pay attention to what you actually experience here. What is it like to choose? What is it like to make this completely free choice? You got a new film? Okay. Do it one more time. All right, just clean the slate. Think of a few more films and choose one. Did you see any evidence for free will here? Because if it's not here, it's not anywhere. So we better be able to find it here. So let's look for it. Well, first, let's set aside all the films you've never seen or heard about and whose names and imagery are unknown to you, right? Needless to say, you couldn't pick one of those. And there's no freedom in that, obviously, because you couldn't have picked one of those if your life depended on it. But then there are many other films whose names are well known to you, many of which you've seen but which didn't occur to you to pick. For instance, you absolutely know that The Wizard of Oz is a film, but you just didn't think of it. And if you thought of The Wizard of Oz, apologies, right? But you get my point. You can swap in The Seventh Seal or Mission Impossible or The Deer Hunter there. And if you're hearing this for the first time and you thought of all those films, well, then we really are living in a simulation and it's all about you, apparently. So consider the few films that came to mind, right? In light of all the films that might have come to mind, but didn't. And ask yourself, were you free to choose that which did not occur to you to choose? As a matter of neurophysiology, your Wizard of Oz circuits were not in play a few moments ago. For reasons that you can't possibly know and could not control, based on the state of your brain, The Wizard of Oz was not an option, even though you absolutely know about this film. And if we could return your brain to the state it was in a moment ago and account for all the noise in the system, adding back any contributions of randomness, whatever they were, you would fail to think of The Wizard of Oz again and again and again until the end of time. Where is the freedom in that? It's important to see that whether the universe is fully determined or it admits of 
randomness, the picture is the same. Okay, determinism gives you no freedom, obviously. It would just be mere biochemical clockwork. But randomness gives you no freedom either. Okay, if you knew that your next choice of a film would be the result of a random process, some quantum roll of the dice, that would be the antithesis of what most people mean by free will. There's no will in that. And if that same random influence appeared a trillion times in a row, just by chance, you would think of the same film a trillion times in a row, just by chance. I mean, no matter how we think about causation, whether things are determined or random, or some combination of the two, there's no place for you as the conscious subject to stand that isn't downstream of causes that you can't inspect or anticipate. Everything is just appearing in consciousness. Again, focus on the experience here. You can forget about the metaphysics. Free will is an enduring problem for philosophy and science for one reason. People think they experience it. They feel they have it. Do you experience it? Again, if it's not here, it's not anywhere. Right? The only constraint you've been given is to think of a film. And you can pick anyone you want. And you can take as long as you want. It is likely that every other choice you have made in your life has been more constrained than this one. What job to take, who to marry, whether to have kids, who to vote for. Most choices in life are much more obviously constrained by other variables than this one. So if you're not free to simply pick a film right now, I don't know where you're going to find free will anywhere in your life. So really pay attention to the experience. Okay, Ryan, do you feel silly now? Yeah, I don't know what, what I've been thinking about. I mean, the, the, if you're not going to find free will in randomly thinking of a movie, where are you going to find free will? I, I just, I don't know. Um, yeah, no, I mean, this this example, I mean, he does, he and again, this is an example of how, and I'm sure people have made this objection to him. Um, I know people have. He always goes to this kind of example. In the in the last debate, debate uh, breakdown we did with him a while ago, he had, I think it was think of a country or think of a city at random. And yeah, I mean, he... So he'll always say this, like, this is the sort of idea that motivates free will. If you can't find free will here, where is it going to be? And so, like, um, I don't think he said it right in that clip, but he has, like, he he asserts that he has, like, two ideas about what the common sense notion of free will involves. And one is the idea that we could do otherwise than we actually do. And the other one is the idea that we are the conscious source of all of our thoughts and all of our actions. Um, so it's the second one that's really coming into play here. Um, and I just think that's ridiculous. I mean, where, where does he get the idea that people even think that they are going to be the conscious source of which movies pop into their head or just in general, which thoughts um, ever pop into our head? And like this kind of example is especially frustrating because it's such an arbitrary and meaningless thing. Like I have no reasons to think of one movie rather than another. There's no, no one's ever going to, uh, praise or blame me for choosing the Wizard of Oz over Chinatown, or, or whatever, whatever dumb examples you want to, uh, to what you want to get at. It's not the kind of decision that philosophers are ever talking about when they're talking about the kinds of things that actually motivate the concept of free will. When philosophers are talking about free will, they're talking about the kinds of situations where we actually have do, we do have reasons to care about one decision over another, and where the choice might actually reflect something deep about our character and who we are and what we value um, and where there could actually be one good reasons to choose one or the other, where someone might actually praise us or blame us for what we're doing, where we're actually going to engage in deliberation. Um, so I know this is just, this just seems he's setting up like a crazy straw man. He's like, I, I, I find it hard to imagine that anyone would listen to this and be like, Oh yeah, you've showed me that, um, I, yeah. I didn't. I didn't choose which movie popped into my head. Therefore, I don't have free will. I yeah, just... I, I mean, it's, it's it's particularly bizarre that he says that if you don't have it here, you don't have it anywhere. Yeah, uh, because uh, this is just transparently not the kind of thing that people are usually thinking of, regardless of what their position is mm -hmm. on free will when they talk about free will, right? Like, yeah. Uh, for I mean, for yeah, one, I've never I've never seen a free will skeptic use this kind of example, even when free will people. 
I mean, there are a lot of people, and I do want to emphasize this, like free will skepticism is a reasonable view on free will. And like, there are good arguments for it. I've never heard a skeptic make use this kind of example though. It's like an example of freedom. Like this is just not what anyone has in mind. There are likewise good arguments for utilitarianism. Yeah. Though. And yeah. moral realism in general, just yeah. not those. <laughs> yeah. Right. yeah. yeah. I didn't, I didn't have reflect well, on, uh, the, you can frame this by asking yourself, like, what decisions in, in the past would you be most disturbed uh, upon learning were actually not free decisions? If I learned that, for example, when I picked a card in a card, yeah. that I was actually subtly being manipulated by the magician to pick the two of diamonds, that would not disturb me at all. I mean, mm -hmm. maybe it would piss me off a little bit, but not really. But yeah. if I learned that like my decision to have kids or yeah. move to Buffalo, New York, or to join the DSA, if I learned that those decisions weren't decisions that I had any say in, that I yeah. wouldn't have control those decisions, that would be really disturbing. Yeah, that's right. If you if you thought, yeah, I mean, the thing that's that's missing here is like this is not a situation where re reasons come into it at all, and those yeah. are the kinds of decisions that are paradigmatically we think of as free decisions are the ones where we're applying our reasoning processes, where where we are sensitive. You know, I mean, philosophers who both agree and disagree with the idea of free will, will the paradig will agree the paradigmatic example is the one where we are actually sensitive to reasons and responding to reasons. Um, whether that's completely sufficient to, to ground the kind of free will we want, that's that's debatable. Um, but this kind of example doesn't even begin to touch the issue. Like, doesn't even come close to it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think of the kinds of uh, like so to pick somebody who is a philosopher who's completely outside of the tradition of the way that um, you know that that I think about free will. You know, which which is you know which is mostly an you know a result of knowing Ryan. But uh, I have. Like uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, right? In, in, his, mm -hmm. in his essay uh, "Existentialism as a Humanism," uh, his his like his example of a free decision in that essay is about a student who uh, came to him uh, during you know World War II uh, to say that he he was he was wrestling with whether to stay with his, his elderly mother. You know, he was his only his mother's only remaining you know source of support. Uh, and she really needed him to stay and take care of him uh, or whether he should go join the French resistance, you know, to, to drive out the Nazis, which he felt like he had a patriotic duty to do. And also I think one of his brothers, you know, you know like his brother had been killed by the Nazis and, and he, did, he didn't know what to do. Uh, Sartre, by the way, like gave him like the least helpful possible answer, which is like, you, you know, you just have to figure it out for yourself. But, um, but he, but like thinking about an example like that, right? Yeah. The whole point is that he, like the student, has has really strong reasons for both alternative courses of action, and in fact, they're both so strong that he's incredibly torn between them. Mm -hmm. uh, and different philosophers will disagree about what it would take for whatever decision he made in that scenario to count as uh, as free will, right? So like one. Yeah. Who, which a lot of compatibilists, people who think that even if everything's determined, so given the exact same starting point, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he'd always come to the same decision, uh, you know, that that's compatible with it counting as a free decision, it being under his control in whatever way it takes for it to make sense to praise or blame him, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that they, they think those philosophers might think like this is a popular version of compatibilism that like all it really, that like what we mean when we say that you're acting freely, that your, that your decision is under your control in the right way is that your reasons responsive mechanism. In other words, your ability to understand and be moved by reasons for and against, you know, different courses of action mm -hmm. is what was, you know, that that was what was in charge of your action, you know, in, in the right way. Whereas other philosophers who are incompatibilists who think that if everything was determined, you know, it's, it's not free might say, well, no, uh, that you have to be, um, yeah, in addition to be responsive to reasons, you've got to add, yeah. yeah, yeah, you've got to add other conditions, and those other conditions are going to be incompatible with determinism. That, like, yeah. you're, that you're, that, like, that the that the reasons that move you ultimately have to 
uh, originate with you in the right way, in a way that they would they wouldn't be really really from you if mm-hmm. they arose from a chain of cause and effect that that started you know before you were born. You know, for example. Yeah. Uh, and, and fair enough, right? Yeah. But like, that's like a really interesting, really difficult philosophical debate. But like this is like. Like this is like one short step away from saying that if you don't get to decide what you dream about, you don't have free will. <laughs> yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't really understand what the example. I mean, you guys have actually explained why it was a silly example, but like when he was talking, I was like, "What is he on about?" Like, yeah, p- picking a movie. It's like, what? I, what do I want for dinner tonight? You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it, it seems such a banal example to discuss the meaning of free will. Well, it's even yeah. worse, though, because when you pick what you're going to have for dinner, at least you might have reasons for choosing one restaurant. Yeah, at least some minimal reasons. Yeah, this it's so bizarre that he he literally says, like, this is the sort of decision that motivates the idea of free will. And that's just not true for anyone who's ever thought for two seconds about free will. This is it not... Really, it has echoes of his... Um, of his worst misery experiment, and that he's like... Think of this thing. Don't look over there. Yeah. Think about this. Only think about it is, this. It is like a stage. I think Forrest was saying this before we did the show. Like he has a very strong like stage magician vibe. It's like look over here. <laughs> Don't pay attention to where the real work's going on. Just look at look at my look at my hands over here. And then I, and then he yeah. says, as You're, soon as you admit that this yeah. thing is the way that I have described it, then you've given up the game for everything else. I need you to. Uh, yeah, it's yeah. Empty, right? Yeah, I mean, like, and this, yeah, like, this is literally you're not like it. Like, there's no will in exactly like, forget whether it's free or not. There's no yeah. will in exactly. which movie rises to the surface of your thoughts, yeah. and yeah, nobody is, nobody thinks there is any will in that. Like, like yeah. it doesn't like like forget whether it's free will or unfree will. There's just no will. You know that like yeah, right. if you're deciding what to have dinner, yeah. you're at least making a decision. Yeah. whether it's a free decision or not, you know, but like there's no, there's no decision and nobody thinks that there's a decision when it comes to like which movie bubbles to the surface of your mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. It's uh, very bizarre. It's a very bizarre straw man. Like the idea that if you. The, intellectual of our age, Ryan. Yeah. <laughs> intellectual of our age. It's, He's definitely the weakest out of the uh, new atheists. Definitely the weak link. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. No, oh yeah. No, that, no yeah. Quite yeah. a long way. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Dawkins embarrasses himself, and a lot. Uh, Hitchens uh, shamed himself. Yeah. Yeah. But at least, but at least they also had, like, they both made real intellectual con- uh, yeah. contributions to discourse, at least in some areas. Right. <laughs> and Dawkins you know, used to come to my bar, and he's a good tipper. <laughs> Ah, well, there you go. There you there go. You go yeah. That counts will, as have a place in my heart. Yeah, so we get a five-pound note for us. So, ah, that's nice. Yeah, I mean, Dawkins is is a real, you know, serious evolutionary biologist, and also one of the most talented popularizers of evolutionary biology ever. Yeah. Um, great writer, you know, like very good at you know popularizing you know scientific concepts from his field. A little dumb when he wanders outside of his field, uh, but uh, but very good at that at least. Uh, and um, and yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens obviously is is was was a amazing writer and and uh, and and a very like thoughtful and perceptive thinker in many areas. Um, you know, even if yes, he, he shamed himself with some of his late in life foreign policy positions. Uh, and uh, Daniel Dennett, like, is the least exciting of the four, but I think also should get credit for being the only one of the uh, four horsemen who doesn't seem to be like a huge asshole in any way. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. Isn't, yeah. That, isn't that quite a striking statement that, you know, he was the weakest of those four? Four guys, and now he's like the kid. He's like the most intellectual member of the intellectual dark web. Like yeah. he's, he's like the compared to Peterson or oh what, yeah, compared to Peterson, he's like positively. Uh, oh yeah, he's, oh, yeah. yeah, he's a genius. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, I mean, yeah, I, I mean, yeah, he just, uh, Daniel Dennett just put out a book with Greg Caruso about this exact topic that we've been uh, talking about. I was just going to, yeah, I just going to mention that, how much I resent you for, because I was, before we, before this week, I was just starting to read the Caruso Dennett book, and it's like real high-level discourse between two of the top-level people arguing between compatibilism and incompatibilism, and then I had to stop that and go immerse myself in sam harris rhetoric on the free will problem yeah which which and, and it's also remarkable i think i looked it up once like I, I i did a quick search within the document and that that like 50 page free will book mm -hmm. uh, that harris wrote the word compatibilism appears like twice three times oh, in there. and he straw man's compatibilism so badly when where he does mention i mean he i mean literally and, and it's clear it's like this is a dig he i it feels like he does it and i know dennett took it this way <laughs> that he like he compares compatibilism to theology and he does that as like a dig directly at his friend dan dennett and it's just yeah. just like straw manning and being a dick about it and, well and he also says that like compatibilism is the view that a puppet has free will if it loves its strings yes, with, yes. like is is like literally just like okay, there are views about free will according to which, um, according to which whether you see your decision as being free is, is relevant in some way, um, yeah. you know. But also, uh, that's not like the only or even the main compatibilist position. Like 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 no. if, if you have views like the ones we we're talking about, where what really matters is 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 reasons responsiveness. You know, you're willing yeah. you know, your ability to to understand and be moved, you know, by reasons for and against different forms of action to deliberate. None of that has absolutely anything to do with how you conceptualize what you're doing, you know? Exactly. Exactly. So it, it's just, yeah. it's, it, it, it's silly. He's, he's, yeah. he's, 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 he's bad and he should feel bad about <laughs> it the world. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, that's as, as good an in conclusion as we're going to come to. Uh, I, I know that Mark needs to go feed his children. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Andrew's right. I do get fired up about compatibilism. This is the one thing in life I get passionate about. Hockey, hockey. <laughs> yeah. Wellness is when you have to feed your children and leave your podcast. <laughs> Uh, uh, weakness is what you have to leave. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's children. right. Nothing yeah. but nothing but podcasting. Yeah. No. Yeah. I, I, I know. This I, seems I, like a situation where you should eat the baby so the podcast can keep going. Oh, by the way, actually, that's a good reminder uh, that our uh, graphic designer Jandra World uh, made a uh, made a quick little image of uh, of me uh, me getting ready to eat a baby. Uh, in, uh, in response <laughs> to uh, that early Paris clip, that could be Mark getting ready to eat his baby instead of feeding it. <laughs> no philosopher would have a problem with this. <laughs> no, it's a beautiful thing. This is actually in the the Stanford Encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The baby eating entry where it says you should eat babies. Yeah. The conclusion, therefore, you should eat babies. Yes. If it will interfere with your podcast. All right. All right. I'm gonna go medicate my daughter. Um that was a pleasure, everyone. I really enjoyed it. Um nice Ben, hey, congratulations on your first year. It's been great. I'm I'm so proud of you. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah, thank you for having us for the season finale. This is great. All right. Thanks, guys. Love you. See you soon. Love, Love you too. Bye. Bye.